Yo, yo, welcome back to the HQ. As always, it's your man's Nicholas Big Dogs, BDGE Fantasy Football, whether you're joining us on YouTube or via the podcast. Welcome back. We're in the muck again. We're in the grit. It's Monday. No better way to start your week off than joining me for 15 minutes in the Muck Monday, where we're discussing two controversial players when it comes to fantasy football 2018. This is a long-awaited one, I think. Stefan Diggs versus Josh Gordon. Which highly polarizing wide receiver do you want to own in 2018 fantasy football? I'm feeling good. It's June 16th right now, which means taxes were just paid yesterday. I got a whole nother quarter of tax-free living, baby. As you can see, I'm living on island time right now, so we're feeling good. This is going to be a good at man I really get in the grit here prior to starting this off I really didn't know how I felt about Stefan Diggs and Josh Gordon but I have a strong feeling of who I want now let's get into the video baby All right, so first thing we're gonna do is look at their ADPs right now. Before we do that though, I wanna hear your thoughts. What I want you to do is drop a comment down below. Before you hear any of my analysis or breakdown, go down into the comment section. One, hit that thumbs up button on the way down if you've been enjoying my In The Muck breakdowns. Do that for me first. Two, right now, choose which one you would rather have. Straight up, would you rather have Diggs or Gordon on your fantasy team for 2018? I wanna know what your thoughts are prior to hearing my analysis and my breakdown. And then at the end of the video, after you hear everything, I want you to go back down, comment on the same thread, and let me know if your opinion has changed at all. So do that first, hit that thumbs up button down there, and then drop a comment. Do you want Diggs or do you want Josh Gordon? Straight up before hearing any of my analysis, because I'm interested to hear, because I think my opinion changed as I did this analysis. So, and I did the average of the draft app, MFL 10 and fantasy football calculator, because I think those are three like reputable sources. And I wanted to just get an overall feel for where they're going everywhere. And it turns out that they're super close. Diggs 37 overall, Josh Gordon 39, wide receiver 15, wide receiver 16. First, we're going to start by breaking down Stefan Diggs. And completely honest, before I started this, this article, I had no idea how I felt about Diggs. Um, I really didn't have a good viewpoint on it, but after doing this, after breaking it down, I think that I have a much better understanding of how I feel about Diggs. Now, with Diggs, the talent is obvious, right? How good he is kind of jumps off the screen at you, and the things that he's flashed with us is uh, is just very promising and, and good projection of the future that we've seen so far for Stefan Diggs. But for one reason or another, well, literally just pretty much one reason, the injuries, he hasn't really been able to put it all together for a single full season. He's been in the NFL for three years now. He's never finished as a top 15 fantasy wide receiver. And you eventually start to ask yourself, like, okay, do I want to keep gambling? Do I want to keep taking the risk? Is it ever going to happen? Uh, and I certainly think he is capable. I don't think that's the case, that he's never going to get there, right? He's still super young. He's just 24 years old. He'll turn 25 in November. There are a lot of people that are kind of on board with the fact that, or the thought of, Stephon Diggs, like this is his breakout, breakout year where he's where he turns into like a top three, top five fantasy wide receiver. He's the next coming of Antonio Brown. Um, while I'm not sure I'm really at that point, I, I do really like what I see from Diggs in terms of uh, his 2018 outlook. So Diggs, you know Diggs, he's uh, he's six feet tall, like 190 poundish. So he's got that small frame, just like Antonio Brown. That's why he's gonna kind of being compared to him. And like I said, he's going to be turning 25 in November. So not only is he at like the peak of his uh, athletic prime, but he'll be entering the peak of his NFL career as a wide receiver. And it's only kind of going to go up from here. So he appeared in 14 games last year in 2017, uh, which is the third year in a row that he's actually failed to hit 16 games in a season. So he's yet to play a full season in his three NFL season seasons, right? Um, in his 14 games last year, Sorry, I'm just going to run through all this stuff quickly. I don't care if I mess up. I really don't feel like editing this shit, but it's going to come out good. I got some good points for y'all. 14 games last year he played in 2017 with the Vikings. 64 catches on 95 targets, 845, 849 yards, excuse me, and a career high eight touchdowns. Uh, don't forget how we started off last year. Actually, how we started off each of the last two years. He started off on fire, right? Two of the first three weeks in 2017, he was the fantasy wide receiver one. Um, so you're like, okay, this is it, right? If I projected the breakout for him in 2017, like it's right here, like it's coming. Like I hit that on the head, right? Um, and then he and then he slowed down. The coaching staff decided to move Thielen into the slot, moving Diggs as like a as a flanker or an outside receiver, which um, worked out. It was a great move for the Vikings as a team. 
the worry for me about Diggs reaching that elite fantasy level is whether or not he's even the number one on his team. Last year, Adam Thielen commanded 27% of the Vikings' targets. Diggs only had a 21% target share. And you have to remember, right, they're feeding Dalvin Cook, Latavius Murray, uh, probably 13 to 15% of the targets, Kyle Rudolph between 14 to 16% of the targets. Who knows who their wide receiver three is going to be. But if Diggs is not even the highest targeted player on his team, can he be a top five, top eight fantasy wide receiver? That becomes a question. Overall, I mean, the move for Thielen into the slot was a great one for the team. Uh, you know, as anyone knows, or as anyone who's watched Stephon Diggs, he is an absolute magician on the outside in terms of a route runner, in terms of being a technician at the position uh, versus press coverage, man coverage, zone coverage. It doesn't matter. He doesn't need to be in the slot to get open, where I think a guy like Adam Thielen, who won't explode off the uh, off the screen athletically, might need that because he needs softer coverage. Now, Stephon Diggs does not need that. According to Matt Harmon of NFL.com, he does the reception perception where he takes samples of every single wide receiver or the top ones, and he breaks them down looking at every single route the guy has run, breaking down um, the route tree, the success rate versus all the coverages and, and all the different routes that he's running, the success rate for that. Now, Diggs grades tremendously. He's one of the top receivers every single year in reception perception. He said he graded really, really high as a rookie, and he's actually improved every single season. So he's working on his craft and getting better. Last year in 2017, Diggs ranked as the number one wide receiver in success versus man coverage, which is what wide receivers see often, especially on the outside. You're always seeing man coverage. Number two, Antonio Brown. So Diggs was actually better versus man coverage than Antonio Brown was last year. Whoop, whoop. Where else did Stefan Diggs rank highly? Per player profiler, he ranked 12th in the NFL in production premium, 10th in target premium, which is basically just, um, it, it's an efficiency number that player profiler uses to say like how well you did above what the average wide receiver would do or something. So very highly in that. Fourth overall in the NFL in terms of QB rating when targeted, 119.2. Top nine in fantasy points per route run, according to Pro Football Focus in both standard and PPR leagues. But... Here are, the big ta- here are the big points for Stefan Diggs that I want to drive home. This is all kind of leading up to this. The most important thing I see is Stefan Diggs ranked number one in the NFL among wide receivers last year in contested catch rate, 83.3%. He caught 83.3% of his contested catches last year. Think about that for a second. You know why that's absolutely humongous. I'm not, I'm, I mean, I don't know it. I had to dive in and I'm like, what does that actually mean in terms of like real life theory for the Vikings and what the 20, 2018 outlook meant? I think that contested catch rate is going to dictate why he separates himself from Adam Thielen this year. What I mean by that is in the red zone and in the end zone where he's going to be scoring touchdowns. Sorry, I need some caffeine in me. Y'all remember if you're an OG from the channel, you remember when I used to try to get sponsored by Monster for every video, I'd have a can and that would, what would get me get me through it. And I'd be like, if you're if you're a rep from Monster, reach out to me. One asshole actually commented one time on the channel, was like, I'm a Monster rep, email me this. He was a fucking fraud, fake news. Wasn't really for Monster. And I think ever since that day, I stopped doing it. Monster missed out on a massive opportunity. Fantasy football is like the perfect industry for a Monster sponsorship. You know what I mean? Like we're just like nerds digging into computers. We need that energy. Like I would rep the shit out of them and, and they could have got in on the ground floor. And now you know what? I want six figures. I walk in Monster's building like I'm the shit. I tell the sponsors, give me 50 million or I'm gonna quit. If you're a Monster rep out there right now in my audience, email me, nick at bigdogsfantasy.com. Maybe we can work something out. Where was I? What the fuck was I even talking about? Um, okay, I was talking about red zone and end zone targets. Thielen played in all 16 games this year, right? He played in two more games than Stefan Diggs and saw 41 more overall targets on the year. But he only had four more red zone targets and two more 10 zone targets. So 41 overall, only four more red zone, two more 10 zone targets. Thielen had 17 red zone targets. Diggs had 13. Here's what pops out to me. Diggs' catch percentage in the red zone was nearly 85% on those 13 targets. Thielen's was 29% on those 17 targets. Thielen turned just two of his 17 red zone targets into scores. Diggs scored an outrageous seven touchdowns on his 13 red zone targets, guys. Inside the 10, he scored on three of six targets. Thielen scored on one of eight. 
Do you know why that is? Do you know why Diggs was so much better in there? It was because of that contested catch rate, guys. When you're in the red zone, when you're in the 10 zone, the game moves a lot faster. The coverage is a lot tighter. Throws are a lot more difficult. Catches are way more contested. When you have a guy like Stefan Diggs who can catch contested passes, he becomes a focal point of the red zone and the end zone. This is where I see the new quarterback, Kirk Cousins, coming into play, right? Because speaking historically, I think, I mean, I think, listen, in terms of the uh, the, the quarterback situation overall, Case Keenan was great. And I think people are underestimating how good he really was for the Vikings last year. I think they're underestimating him as a quarterback in total. I think he's going to surprise a lot of people in 2018 and play well. He always has when given the chance. Uh, but that being said, Kirk Cousins is at, at very worst, he's going to be on level with what Case Keenum did last year. He's probably going to be better if you just look at what he did with the Redskins weapons there. Uh, I think he threw for like 27 touchdowns last year. Very depleted weapons um, that he had there too. So very a really successful season for Cousins despite the fact that he'll be with a much better uh, group of weapons here in Minnesota. But historically, Kirk is someone who has not been good in the red zone. He has he has trouble scoring when he gets close to the end zone, especially when he doesn't have weapons that perform really well down there. And that's where I think Stefan Diggs comes into play. I want to look back at last year, Kirk Cousins. Um, we look back at Washington. Who were his most targeted red zone targets? It was Josh Doxson <clears throat> had 16 red zone targets. Jamison Crowder had 14 red zone targets. So those when he got down there, those were the guys he looked at first and, and most often. Doxson caught just 31% of those 16 targets, and he had a 42.9% overall contested catch rate. So that's not, I mean, that's not actually terrible, 42.9%, but it's nothing compared to Diggs's 83% contested catch rate. Jamison Crowder, 14 red zone targets. He caught 50 of them, but again, um, nothing compared to Diggs's 85% catch rate in the red zone. And Crowder's contested catch rate overall it's not just not just in the red zone, like overall on the field. Crowder's contested catch rate was abysmal. It was like 36.4%. So when um, oh, also, then we have Ryan Grant, who despite not being like heavily targeted, he wasn't really used that much in Washington last year. He saw red nine uh, red nine, I was about to say red nine zone targets. Nine red zone targets last year. Uh, and you want to know why? It's because Kirk trusted him down there, and the reason Kirk trusted him down there is because Ryan Grant's contested catch rate was 79% on the season. He caught seven of his nine red zone targets. So he wasn't heavily utilized, but when they got to the red zone, Kirk was like, I want to throw it to this guy because I know he'll catch it in contested areas. So when he doesn't have good red zone targets, he still finds a way to give it to those guys. And now he has Stefan Diggs, who's proven to be an elite talent. And I think he's going to utilize um, Diggs down there just, I think he's going to use the shit out of him. I feel like Diggs is going to hit that eight touchdown mark with ease. And I think that they're probably going to surpass that. I think he's probably going to hit 10 to 12. If if he can match Thielen's number of red zone looks, which I expect that, that, I, I expect that to flip. And I expect Diggs to have more looks than Thielen. And given his efficiency down there, uh, I think Diggs could score upwards of like 12 or more touchdowns this year. So the second big thing here, the second huge point to take away, and I want you guys to pay close attention to this point is Diggs' injury history. Like I said, he's yet to play in a full 16-game season out of three years in the NFL. And I'm, I'm very thankful I found this nugget last year. So check this out. And this is from, I don't know why I remember this, to be honest with you. I have no idea how this popped back into my mind. This is from last year. This is from John Paulson, 4 for 4 Fantasy Football. Very, very good analysis there. At 4 for 4 underscore John on Twitter. Highly recommend you follow him. This is what he wrote, the disclaimer, this is what he wrote last summer coming into 2017. So this does not include this year, right? This is not written this summer. So basically he talked about Diggs being on the injury report and off the injury report. Throughout the year, Diggs was on and off the injury report and there was a stark contrast in his production when he was healthy. In the seven games where he was listed on the injury report at some point during the week, he averaged four catches, 37 yards, and 0.14 touchdowns. In those games, he never cracked the 60-yard mark, and he found the end zone just one time. In the six games where Diggs was not on the injury report, fully healthy, he averaged 9.3 catches for 107 receiving yards a game and .33 touchdowns. He cracked the 60-yard mark in five of six games and hit 100 yards three times. This is basically telling you that when Diggs was on the injury report, he played like shit. When he was fully healthy, he played amazing. 
That's like buyer beware right there. If you're going to draft Diggs, just remember that point. When he's on the injury report, maybe you want to look for someone uh, a better spot, someone better in your lineup. Now, I took it a step further, and I went back to 2017, and I want to see what weeks was he on the injury report, right, to see if, you know, what John Paulson found was actually, like, true. And he missed two games last year, right? It was week six and seven. He got hurt in week five. He pulled. He uh, messed up his groin against the Bears in week five. Missed six, seven. Was on the injury report week eight as questionable. What happened in What happened in week eight when he was on the injury report? He went four for 27, zero touchdowns. Um, and then the week after that, they had a bye. The week following that, guess what? He was fully healthy, not on the injury report anymore. Four for 78 and a score. So what I think the problem is, uh, people are trying to pace Diggs' pace out from last year based on those two games. One in which he left week five early because he pulled his groin, which you know as a as a fantasy analyst you should discount that because you're not going to like put you don't expect someone to get hurt in the game and you know you don't want to use those stats for pacing out through a year. And I want to go a step further and say that I want to discount the week eight game. Uh, in which he was on the injury report, right? Because we found that to be a huge factor in whether or not he plays well. So what I want, what I wanted to look at is you take those two games out and you can look at that as a 12-game pace by itself, right? If you just take those two games out, he played in 12 games last year. But I wanted to do is take it a step further and I wanted to include his two playoff games because I think it's fair to include the two games because he played against the Eagles and the Saints. So those are two good pass defenses. So it's not like those are going to be skewed by pass defenses. You're using two good, two good teams, two good games. And... Using those two games, replacing the week five when he got injured and the week eight when he was on the injury report with the two playoff games, and this is what his 16-game pace turns out to from last year. 83.4 catches, 1,171 receiving yards, and 10.3 touchdowns. That would have finished him as wide receiver four and half-point PPR last year in front of Julio Jones. Maybe you think I'm reaching here, replacing those two games, but I think it's a fair swap, to be honest with you. And it just goes to show that if you have to, um, if you have Stephon Diggs, if you draft him and he's on the injury report, he's less than 100%, maybe you want to look for someone else. But in the games when he's fully healthy, he's been an absolute monster. So that's what I want to leave you with. It's the fact that he's so good at contesting catches, he's going to use, he's going to be used in the red zone because Kirk likes to use guys like him in the red zone when he has them, um, that I think he's going to surpass Adam Thielen down there. And the fact that, um, his injury report tells you more than uh, likely how he's going to perform that game. So let's move on to Josh Gordon. Well, assuming that this thing is still on. Yeah, we Gucci. Uh, before we move into that, guys, there is two under two weeks left for you to get my draft guide uh, for a discounted price. You can pre-order it now. Uh, until July 1st, the price will go up. The, the first issue of it is going to be coming out either July 8th or July 9th. And guys, this uh, this draft guide, I've been working on it nonstop the last few days, is going to be amazing. So much value. It's my top sleepers, my top busts, my must draft players, um, just all exclusive videos and blog posts that you're not going to get on my YouTube channel or on my blog, my top 250 overall rankings, each uh, positional rankings broken down by tiers, including my big dogs got to eat Bible, which is a position by position, huge breakdown article where I say like the optimal strategy for drafting uh, for 2018. I mean, it's going to be updated weekly rankings, uh, all the news that comes out the week prior. I'm going to break it down like the top three or five op things that happen in the news. Really cool stuff. Go check it out. BigDogsFantasy.com. You can pre-order it now. July 1st, the price will go up. We're already at over 100 pre-orders now. So thank you guys so much for everyone that's pre-ordered the guide so far. It will not let you down. It will be the most valuable piece of fantasy football, whatever, advice that you can pay for this offseason. I promise you that is sick. It will not disappoint. So uh, link will be in the description as well as you can click that link right up there. It'll take you to the website and you can just hit shop on the top if you don't see it. But I just wanted to plug that. So um, if you're enjoying the video so far, make sure you hit that thumbs up button down below so other people can find it and can help them. But let's move on to Josh Gordon. And if you want to talk upside, you can't really talk it without talking about Josh Gordon, right? He walks the walk, man. <sighs> well, I don't know. He talks the talk. Well, no, he talk he talks the talk. He doesn't really talk the talk. I don't even know what the fuck I'm saying right now. He walks the walk. 
He does a damn thing when he's on the field. I don't think we need to go over Josh Gordon's history, right? We all know he's amazing when he's on the field, or he was a specimen, uh, and he looked like he looks like he's back to back to his weights, as Drake would say, right? Even though Drake's pretty much dead now, thanks to Pusha T, the God. If you still haven't checked out Daytona, Pusha T's album, you're missing out on a motherfucking classic. Anyways, um, what, there's a lot of things you need to consider when we go into Josh Gordon, right? He's coming bike from from missing like 600 fucking 98 days of, of not having football for one reason or another, right? Drugs, injuries, whatever it might have been. I don't even think he was injured. I don't know. But finally stepped back onto the football field last year in week 13 for the Browns. Long awaited, long hyped up. Played in their final five games. In those five games, he caught 18 passes on 43 targets. 355 yards and a touchdown. Now, the catch percentage, 18 of 43, is abysmal. But the catchable target rate he had in terms of like passes that were actually deemed catchable per player profile ranked 86th amongst wide receivers. So, obviously, way more of a component of bad quarterback play than actually Josh Gordon not being able to catch the ball. No worries there. So, what you have to love about Gordon as well is even during that five game span, his yards per reception number was 18.6. I'm actually, I actually didn't check where that ranked in the last five weeks of the season among all fantasy players. But the promising part about that 18.6 yards per reception is if you go back to that 2013 season where, uh, where he absolutely just broke out and went for like 1700 receiving yards on, um, in 14 games, his yards per reception was 18.9 so he's right back there as like a big time playmaker and you know explosive making big plays and that's something that you expect from josh gordon right so clearly he hasn't really lost a step um let's see where his yards per reception ranked over the last five weeks of the season and it was oh, okay well the sample size is actually out of control but anyone with more than What's reasonable for five five games? Twenty targets, four targets a game. So anyone with more than twenty tar twenty targets or more, he ranked one, two, three, fourth over the last five weeks of the season in terms of yards per reception. Only Marvin Jones, Tyreek Hill, and Keelan Cole topped him in that area. So uh, a monster five weeks for Josh Gordon, full of big plays. Now. Clearly, the explosion is still there. With a full offseason, he should be ready to put it all into full effect in 2018, right? Gordon's still relatively young. He just turned 27 in April, so there's plenty of youth left in those big-ass trunks, right? You're seeing the pictures of him all offseason on Instagram, on, on Twitter, or whatever, of him looking like he's got fucking multiple biceps. He's got a bicep here and a bicep here and another bicep on his shoulder. He's got three bi He's got six biceps in total on just on his upper body. His forearms kind of look like biceps as well. You're seeing what he looks like, man, and that is just, he's an absolute specimen, man. So the big question mark when it comes to Josh Gordon is not his physical abilities, not his explosion or anything like that. It's whether or not, what state am I in? Um, I love how, like, it's funny because I travel a lot, so people that I don't, like, see often or always ask me, like, what state I'm in. It's not really funny, fucking funny at all. I just find it funny, whatever. Um, so the big question mark here is whether or not Gordon can maintain his elite production with all of the weapons and the changes that happened to the Browns this offseason. During that five-game stretch last year, Josh Gordon saw 26% of the team's target share. That is wide receiver one type numbers, right? Only a few wide receivers will have more than that in a given year. Like Michael Thomas saw like 28%. OBJ is normally around 28 to 30%. Like Mike Evans usually sees... Actually, I think Evans was down last year because they brought in more weapons. But wide receiver ones, like high-end wide receiver ones in fantasy, usually see between like 25 and 30% of their team's target share, which is what Gordon saw last year. That was despite not really having any weapons on the team outside of him on the outside. This year, they bring in Jarvis Landry, who we know has absolutely ate up targets, you know, in Miami. Um, they bring him in to be the slot receiver. They also have their impressive rookie uh, tight end David Njoku who looks to take a step forward this year he only played in 48% of the team's snaps last year so you obviously expect that number to rise and expect him to get more targets in the offense um, then we don't know who's going to play the wide receiver th wide receiver three role but whoever it is is going to be a much much more above average wide receiver than the normal wide receiver three it's either going to be their former first round pick Corey Coleman or Antonio Callaway, their like very, very, very highly talented later round pick this year in drafts, widely considered one of the best wide receivers in the draft, uh, either a first round talent or a second round at worst. He dropped for off field issues. He didn't play in 2017. 
uh, at Florida. But w both guys are extremely talented, are, are very good wide receiver threes. So um, Coleman was banged up a lot last year, which is why the target numbers weren't there. Whoever it is should command at least a decent portion of targets there in the Browns offense. They re-sign their elite pass catching back and dig. Uh, Duke Johnson, they bring in Nick Chubb with a second round pick as well as Carlos Hyde, both guys capable of catching the football. So, oh man, a lot of mouths to feed in Cleveland. Of course, they signed Tyrod Taylor, who is slated to be the starter, at least for the beginning of the season. They, uh, they chose Baker Mayfield first overall as their quarterback of the future. Now, Taylor is a guy who's never been asked to throw the ball. That's definitely a product of being in the Buffalo offense, uh, just in that scheme, because they're constantly ranked among the top rushing teams in terms of volume on a year-over-year -year basis, but we might see it again in Cleveland, right? Hugh Jackson, honestly, it's embarrassing at this point. He just, every every summer, he's like, yeah, we want to run the ball. That's going to be the name of our game. Run, 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 run. They can't do it because when you lose 31 of 32 games, which they've done over the last two years, you can't run the ball because you're always trailing. But you have to expect this team to be better than they've been over the last few years. You have to expect them to win more than one game, right? So that means... They'll have, they'll probably be in more games, right? They'll be capable of winning more games, which means they'll actually be able to run the ball more often. And considering they have three more than capable, if not above average running backs in their backfield with a competent quarterback, that seems like it would, it's a reasonable game plan in, in 2018. Now, when you look back at Hugh Jackson's history, uh, using the site ffstatistics.com run by, uh, what's his name? I can't remember, uh, Addison Hayes or whatever. I'll link his Twitter down below, uh, ffstatistics.com, you could actually look at, break it down by coach, uh, different positions in fantasy and their offense and where they finish. And if you look at the, uh, he has a seven year sample size, Hugh Jackson as either a head coach or an offensive coordinator. The best fantasy finish was uh, wide receiver, for the wide receiver one in his offense was AJ Green as wide receiver eight in fantasy back in 2015. Otherwise, every other top fantasy wide receiver finish has been wide receiver 21 or worse. So he's got one Good year of a top wide receiver, and I'm just throwing that out there. Just thought it be, should be notable. Um, so when it comes to Josh Gordon, my conclusion is kind of this. you got to look at the Browns' offense under, under Hugh Jackson, right? We've seen their run-pass percentage completely skewed over the last two years, uh, very heavily weighted towards passing the ball, obviously because they're always trailing. So they had 574 attempts in 2017, 568 attempts in 2016, Right, so around 570, we could say pass attempts. 0 and 16, 1 and 15. We know what we're gonna get given that record, and it's kind of funny because Vegas still has the Browns as tied for the worst odds in the NFL in terms of win total. They have them at five and a half wins. Either way, that's a five-game improvement over their one win season last year. You could expect that run to pass ratio to come closer to the run heavy pa uh, ratio, and. So let's 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 look at their overall play volume, right? It's a, it's about 935 plays that they've run on offense the last two years. So that's the sample size, and we could project that into year three. We could project that into 2018. Let's say they, they run 935 plays overall, and instead of their 64% pass ratio that they've had over the last two years, like I said, it's going to come down to be more run heavy. We uh, we're gonna look. We're gonna say we're gonna bring it down to 59%, right? Because that's league average, or that's actually above. That's even more pass heavy than league average. So I think that's a realistic projection. If you take 59% of 935 plays, we're looking at 551 pass attempts, and I think that's even high. That's only like 20 less uh, attempts than they had the last couple of years. So I think that's even high. But do you still believe Josh Gordon is gonna get 26% of the targets? I know. I don't think with all these weapons, he's still going to command that high of a target share. I think realistically, if you're looking at it from an honest standpoint, maybe 22 to 24 percent, and that that puts him in the like 120 to 130 target range, which I think is very very reasonable. So that's what I'd probably project both Diggs and Gordon to have. If you're going to put them in the same target total range, who do you want there? Who, do, who you know? Who would you rather choose? Now, obviously, it's really close. I mean looking at their ADPs, looking at their rankings, looking at my rankings, they're like back to back. So it's not like I have one completely over the other, but I do prefer one right now. Gordon obviously has the big playability and he has the crazy upside we've seen overall. But when it comes down to it, I'm leaning Stefan Diggs here. He is my pick of the two. I like the Minnesota offense more. I like the quarterback situation more. I think their defense will set them up for a lot of scoring opportunities. And like I said, I think Diggs surpasses Thielen in the red zone. And in doing that, he hits the eight to 12 touchdown mark again pretty easily. I just think that 
Diggs has a perfect blend of floor and ceiling. And, I mean, you've seen his floor before, but on a per-game basis, when you're not playing him, then you don't have to worry about that because you'll get someone else for it. I think Gordon's floor is lower. His ceiling is probably higher. But, again, you just have to look at the fact that the Browns are five-and-a-half win totals per Vegas. That usually doesn't lend itself to having a, an 8-12 to 12 touchdown score from the wide receiver position. It wouldn't surprise me whatsoever to see Gordon finish with like five to six touchdowns this year. And it would surprise me if Diggs finished at that low of a total. So while I think Gordon probably has the upper hand in yards because he's that yards per reception kind of guy, Diggs will probably outpace him in total catches. Will be up there in yards. He should be around 1,000, 1,200 yards, if not more, in the score percentage. So that's why I like Diggs a little more. I just like the floor is a little higher um, and his ceiling is still way up there. So And before we go, I cannot stop before I... Thank today's sponsor, FantasyJocks.com, industry leader in championship gear for your fantasy sports league. We talking belts, we talking rings, oh, we talking teams, we talking trophies as well, dude. They got the coolest shit on their site. High, high, high quality, best in the industry. I can guarantee you that. These things are 24 karat gold. You can knock, a, you can knock a man's out with one of these bad boys. High quality leather. Get your team's name engraved on it. Whoever wins a chip in your league, you'll have it year over year. Have everyone throwing five bucks for a ring. Have everyone throwing ten bucks for a belt, and you're set for life. I'm telling you, this stuff. Something you don't want to miss out on. Me and my friends play. This is actually our belt that we use in the big money. That's that's how high quality it is. I don't even care if I do that shit. I could drop it on the floor right now. I ain't gonna do it, but you get the principality of what I'm talking about. Belts, trophies, rings, draft boards. If you do a live draft with your boys or your girls, whoever, I ain't discriminating here at Big Dog's Gotta Eat. I will link them down below in the description. Go check out fantasyjocks.com. Highest quality gear in the industry. Use Take 10 for 10% off your purchase. Link down below. Duh. Love me some digs. Let me know again, now that it's over with, who you guys would go with. If you didn't even leave a comment in the first place, doesn't matter. Go comment down below now who you want because I want to see alternate perspectives. I want to hear other points of view from uh, from what you guys think of the two players because they're two guys that I've been choosing a lot of in best ball. I've been kind of rotating on and off. So I own a decent portion of both of them. But in redraft leagues, I'm going to be going with Diggs. If you found this useful, if, you, if you're liking the In The Muck Mondays, please drop a thumbs up down below. Subscribe to the channel. If you are new, because uh, we'll be coming at you with In The Muck Mondays every Monday, every Wednesday, Friday, we do mock drafts. I think Wednesday is starting my breakout column, top three breakouts at each position column next Wednesday. Uh, Sunday, we do Q&A live streams. And don't forget to pre-order the draft guide. Discounted price until July 1st. I'll see y'all on Wednesday. Peace.